Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss how to do a phylogenetic analysis. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Gibbons, forming the family Hylobatidae, are the last extant apes that we will meet. Hylobatidae is also called the lesser apes, referring to their smaller size compared to the great apes, but we shouldn't think any less of them because of that. There are four extant genera of gibbons, Hylobates, Namascus, Hulok, and Symphalangus, containing a combined 20 species. Unfortunately, not even the gibbons can catch a break. Nearly every species is either endangered or critically endangered. The exceptions are ones considered vulnerable and two that are not yet assessed. This is mainly due to, once again, the usual story, habitat loss caused by human-driven deforestation. Gibbons are native to the jungles of northeast India and Bangladesh, to Sumatra, Borneo, and Java. Unlike the orangutans, gibbons are social, although their social groups tend to be small families, an adult breeding pair, and their offspring. They are also highly territorial and may defend their territory with loud vocal displays. Symphalangus, the Siamang, is best known for its loud calls, produced by its enlarged throat sac. Once mated, gibbons are typically monogamous. Gibbons are primarily frugivorous and will also opportunistically eat leaves, insects, and even bird eggs. They also mirror humans in unexpected ways compared to some of the other hominoids. Like humans, gibbons are sexually monomorphic, meaning males and females do not differ substantially in their craniodental features or size. Both sexes exhibit large, scimitar-like canine teeth and ferociously defend their territories from would-be interlopers. This near-complete lack of sex differences, while not necessarily rare, is uncommon in most catarine primates. Some species do exhibit sexual dichromatism, however, in which the males and females have different pelage colors. This may be a means by which to sex strangers in a genus where males and females generally look the same skeletally. There is also something going on with their chromosomes. Recall that great apes have 48 chromosomes except for humans as they have 46 due to a chromosomal fusion. Well, each genus of gibbon has a different diploid chromosome number. Hulok with 38, Hylobates with 44, Symphalangus with 50, and Nomascus with 52. It's not just the number, their chromosomes have experienced numerous intra- and inter-rearrangements as indicated by their centony. As for extinct hylobatids, apart from the potential stem hylobatid Wanmupithecus from 9 to 7 million years ago, only three species are known. Capi ramnagarensis from 13.8 to 12.5 million years ago, Bunapithecus syricus from 700,000 to 126,000 years ago, and Junzi imperialis, from 2,300 to 2,200 years ago that was described in 2018. The type specimen of Junzi was actually discovered in the tomb of the ancient Chinese noble Lady Sha, the grandmother of Qin, the first emperor of China. Junzi was found alongside many other animals, which are believed to have been a royal menagerie of luxury pets. Gibbons are also frequently referenced in Chinese literature and art, which may indicate that hylobatids used to have a much wider distribution in China until a few thousand years ago. All living apes, humans, chimps, gorillas, orangutans, and now gibbons are joined within the ape superfamily Hominoidea, and our last common ancestor appears to have lived about 18 million years ago. Hominoids are distinguished from other primates by having a wider rib cage and shoulder blades that are further towards the back, with the shoulder joint sticking outwards. They also have a wide freedom of motion in the shoulder joint. This likely results from having ancestors who were competent in brachiating, i.e. arm swinging through trees. This is very different from how other arboreal primates move in the trees as they move quadrupedally on the branches. The same would have also been the case for stem hominoids such as proconsul. Thus, during their evolution, apes went from a pronograde, or horizontal posture, to having an orthograde, or upright posture, and moving underneath the branches. Gibbons are amazingly acrobatic brachiators, swinging at 34 miles per hour, faster than a professional cyclist on level terrain, and leaping up to 26 feet in length. This is due to the gibbons ball and socket wrist joint, which greatly reduces the amount of energy needed in the upper arm and torso. 
Researchers have identified genes important in forelimb development, such as TBX5, and connective tissues, such as COL1A1, that have undergone positive selection, likely contributing to Gibbon's stellar arboreal abilities. Though our early hominoid ancestors could probably brachiate, it is unlikely they were as adept at it as Gibbons have come to be. The other unifying characteristic of apes is tail loss. A few Old World monkeys have independently lost their tails, such as the Barbary macaque, sometimes confusingly called the Barbary ape, though not an ape, as well as a variety of other mammals, such as some extinct lemurs, the tailless tenrec, guinea pigs, hamsters, bears, bats, koalas, sloths, and agoutis. The lineage leading to hominoids seems to have lost its tail shortly after our common ancestor with Old World monkeys about 25 million years ago, as seen in early hominoids like Proconsul, Akembo, Afropithecus, and Morotopithecus. The exact genetic reason that hominoids don't have tails is due to an ALU element, part of the retrotransposon whose copy me signal has resulted in over a million of them in our genome. The culprit here is called ALUY, jumping into intron 6 in the gene TBXT. Heterozygous mutations in TBXT leading to reduced to absent tails have been observed in mice, manx cats, dogs, and zebrafish, but individuals homozygous for the mutations are typically not viable. In this case, ALUY is on one side of exon 6, and on the other side is another ALU element called ALUSX1. Together, these ALUs pair up to form a stem loop structure in the pre-mRNA that traps exon 6, resulting in exon 6 not getting transcribed. The researchers even found that splicing out exon 6 causes tail loss in mice. It's worth pointing out that ALUY in TBXT represents a unique insertion in the exact same location in all hominoids, including humans, but no other animals. There is no reason for this unless we descended from a common ancestor who also had it. Now, though there is a clear genetic reason for tail loss, why did the mutation spread in that original population? This is much more shrouded. As previously mentioned, stem hominoids were originally pronograde, like most mammals. This changed in later hominoids, which acquired an orthograde posture. One Miocene hominoid that embodies the transition is Pierolipithecus catalonicus from Spain. Pierolipithecus had a stiffened lumbar region, more like apes, but lacked the specific finger and hand adaptations for below branch suspension, meaning it would have walked quadrupedally atop branches. One group of researchers argued that its orthograde body plan was an adaptation to vertical tree climbing, and an orthograde body plan and taillessness would have both allowed for below branch suspension as well as the evolution of ar arboreal bipedalism. This provokes some questions on how specifically humans originally evolved terrestrial bipedalism. A popular hypothesis proposes that the earliest human ancestors were knuckle walking before evolving terrestrial bipedality. This scenario was supported by the fact that both chimps and gorillas are knuckle walking quadrupeds, because this likely meant that they inherited knuckle walking from their common ancestor, which is also our ancestor. Thus, according to phylogenetic bracketing, our ancestors were inferred to have been knuckle walkers as well. However, this has been put into question. In a 2009 paper, Kivel and Schmidt argued that chimpanzees and gorillas exhibit distinct biomechanical modes of knuckle walking and concluded knuckle walking evolved independently. Furthermore, what is often underappreciated is that apes exhibit a diverse set of postural and locomotor behaviors despite their preferred tendencies. For example, sometimes orangutans and even gibbons stand and walk bipedally, especially when they are on the ground. Gorillas and chimps too walk bipedally on occasions. It's also important to note that living apes represent a fraction of the diversity that used to exist. Extinct ape species likely exhibited various behaviors as well, some with unique tendencies that are not seen in any surviving species. Thus, it's best to consider other possibilities when making inferences about the phenotypes and behaviors of our ancestors. Nevertheless, since it is observed in all extant ape species, some degree of bipedalism likely evolved in apes way before our lineages diverged. This forms the basis of an alternative hypothesis proposed by Susanna Thorpe and colleagues, which says that human bipedalism had an arboreal origin. Their argument is based on a behavior observed in orangutans where they stand bipedally on branches while holding onto other branches with their hands, called hand-assisted arboreal bipedalism. This provides greater stability, which is why orangutans typically do this when they are at the thin ends of branches in order to cross from tree to tree or to reach tasty fruits. There is a clear benefit of having this ability as opposed to climbing 
all the way down to the ground and up the next tree again and again. This behavior is inferred to have been present in the ancestors of all great apes. The arboreal hypothesis holds that our ancestors relied more on hand-assisted arboreal bipedalism while clambering through the trees, which became gradually more specialized until they were able to stand on two legs without hand assistance. In a way, hand-assisted bipedalism was the evolutionary training wheel for evolving terrestrial bipedalism, similar to how gliding is the training wheels for evolving powered flight. This doesn't necessarily mean they were all strictly arboreal. As discussed previously in the gorilla's tale, the ancestors of African apes were probably terrestrial to a greater degree than other apes. Thus, the ancestors of African apes likely exhibited degrees of terrestrial quadrupedalism and hand-assisted arboreal bipedalism. After their divergence, chimps and gorillas specialized terrestrial quadrupedalism into knuckle walking, while humans specialized arboreal bipedalism into terrestrial bipedalism. But what do the fossils show us? As noted before, the fossil record for non-human African apes is rather lacking. Nevertheless, in the recent review paper from 2021, Almasija et al. argue that, given what we do know about the earliest human relatives and extinct apes, it is likely that the last common ancestors of humans and chimps had a generalist behavior compared to either humans or chimps. As they say, quote, a holistic view indicates that the Pan Homo last common ancestor was a Miocene ape with extant great ape-like cognitive abilities, likely possessing a complex social structure and tool traditions. This ape would exhibit some degree of body size and canine sexual dimorphism with large honing male canines, indicating a polygynous sociosexual system. Based on Miocene apes and earliest hominins, it is also likely that the Pan Homo last common ancestor was orthograde and proficient at vertical climbing, but not necessarily adapted specifically for below branch suspension or knuckle walking. Chimpanzees seem to retain the Pan Homo last common ancestor plesiomorphic condition in some regards, e.g. brain and body size, vertebral counts, foot morphology. However, in others, e.g. interlimb, hand, pelvis, length proportions, femoral morphology, early hominins are more similar to generalized Miocene apes. These results further reinforce the idea that functional aspects of other locomotor types were co-opted for bipedalism during hominin origins, close quote. With that aside, we can turn to phylogenetic analyses and how gibbons have made a mess of them. First, phylogenetic tree diagrams are either rooted or unrooted. And some people, cough, Nathaniel Jensen cough, don't seem to understand the difference. A rooted tree clearly depicts one node as the common ancestor of all branches, i.e. the root. In unrooted trees, the ancestor-descendant relationships aren't made explicit. For simplicity purposes, we'll only consider dichotomies, no polytomies, i.e. nodes from which more than two branches stem. As there are four genera of gibbons, there are three possible trees or topologies at the genus level relationships. Move up to five, there are 15 possible topologies, add one more and you're up to 105. With every addition to the set, the number of possible topologies increases sharply. Now let's switch over to rooted phylogenies. Which node is the root, and how is that determined? First, an outgroup must be identified, a clade that is more distantly related to every member of the unrooted tree than the members are to each other. For example, the African elephant could be an outgroup for gibbons because their common ancestor with elephants lived long, long before the common ancestor of all extant gibbons lived. Humans are also an outgroup, or the kangaroo, or you could use multiple outgroups, which could make the determined root of the tree more robust. It should be noted that the outgroup you choose may affect the calculated topology of your in-group, depending on how closely related they are. As a 1998 paper points out, quote, a common problem in phylogenetic reconstruction is the choice of an appropriate outgroup to investigate in-group relationships. Specifically, the character states of the outgroup must be historically similar to those in the in-group so that it can determine which character states shared with the in-group are plesiomorphic. If data are nucleic acid sequences and distant taxa are used to root networks, the character states shared by the outgroup and the in-group may not be based on history but on random similarity. Distant outgroups have been used in many molecular systematic studies. Generally, a random outgroup sequence will join the longest branch of the in-group, making the root position highly unreliable." Close quote. We'll talk more about long branch attraction later on. Next, where is the root in our in-group? To answer this, we must remember our discussion of parsimony in the orangutan's tale. 
what relationship for Gibbons is the most parsimonious given the available data? That brings us to the question of what data we should use. Researchers often give several scores for each taxa based on their presence or absence of particular characters. From this, we could make a simple binary matrix. Does taxon A have four limbs? Yes or no. Grows within an amniotic sac? Yes or no. Has feathers? Yes or no. Has a beak? Yes or no. A yes could be coded as one and no as a zero. The ones and zeros are called character states. A trout would have a zero for every character state. A frog would have a one for the first and a zero for every other. A lizard has one for the first two and zero for the other two. Archaeopteryx has a one for the first three and a zero for the last one. Finally, a sparrow has one for all four. In this simplistic example, the trout is clearly the outgroup. The root of the tree would be between the trout and the other four species. The frog would be next, then the lizard, with Archaeopteryx and the sparrow as sisters. However, phylogenetics is never this easy. In our simplistic example, every character is treated as being equally informative, i.e. we give them the same weight. But that isn't how phylogenetics usually works out. Some characters are easier to change by evolution than others. For example, the presence or absence of feathers is much more informative and should be given a much higher weight than, say, the length of the femur. There is also the issue of choosing to consider two anatomical features as one or as two characters. If two characters in your matrix refer to the same trait, thus their character states strictly correlate with each other, it is equal to giving one character twice the weight. Researchers do have to make such considerations when compiling their data. Researchers were once limited to morphological, embryological, and fossil data, but now genetics has entered the mix too. Although genetics comes with its own set of issues. First, genes mutate at different rates. A sequence of DNA subject to natural selection could change very slowly or very rapidly depending on the selective pressure. Neutral sequences that are not subject to selection, such as pseudogenes, non-functional endogenous retroviruses, and long and short interspersed nuclear elements, will accumulate mutations according to the background mutation rate, giving researchers a clear signal of relatedness. If organisms had separate ancestry, they wouldn't share mutations in non-selected DNA regions, but the opposite is true. For example, humans and all other haplorine primates, which are tarsiers, new and old world monkeys, and apes, share the same mutations in a non-functional pseudogene which used to code for the enzyme l gulonolactone oxidase that, in many other animals, is involved in the production of vitamin C. We wouldn't expect to have the same mutations in this pseudogene if we had separate ancestry from all other primates, but we do. This is strong evidence for our common ancestry. Another issue is the presence of gene duplications and horizontal transmission. Many, many sequences in our genome are duplicates of duplicates. About one in every 100 people has a duplication of an ALU element, which are derived from truncated 7SL RNA genes. We also discussed in the Bonobo's Tale the problem of incomplete lineage sorting, and how that can produce different species trees based on which genes you pick. And there can be regions of DNA between two very distantly related organisms that have become convergently similar. For example, there are isochores, which are 300,000 base pairs long and rich in guanine cytosine bonds, also called GC pairings. Isochores can be found in the nuclear genomes of yeast, plants, trypanosomes, birds, and most mammalian orders. Clearly, this isn't just a matter of common ancestry among all these groups. Researchers have proposed a few mechanisms for why this might occur, such as mutational bias during DNA replication, or, at least for some isochores, natural selection for protein thermal stability. But the point is that these mutations are not on their own indicative of common ancestry. Of course, an organism's features that are most informative for phylogenetic analyses are homologous ones. Homology means that a feature is uniquely shared between an ancestor and its descendants. It doesn't simply mean similarity for the reason we just saw. It wouldn't make any sense to compare characters that didn't arise from a common ancestor because such a comparison would obscure the actual phylogenetic relationship. Imagine trying to compare the wings of birds and bats. They didn't arise from a common ancestor. The closest living relatives of birds are the decidedly flightless crocodiles and alligators, while bats are related to shrews, hoof mammals, pangolins, and carnivorans. The genetic, morphological, and embryological differences between birds and bats vastly outweigh their uniquely shared features. 
So, how do researchers compare sequences of DNA? Intriguingly, this process is relatively similar to how literary scholars compare text segments from the Bible, Canterbury Tales, and other works that have been repeatedly transcribed throughout the centuries. First, you take a sequence that is shared by both taxa, or books, and then you need to align them. By aligning them, you can see which base pairs correspond to each other. This also may show where some bases were deleted from or added to one of the sequences. Imagine, for instance, that you're comparing a sequence between two species that is identical, except for the fact that one sequence is 2,000 bases long and the other is 1,700 bases long. Aligning the sequences tells us where those missing bases are so we don't end up comparing the wrong bases, artificially increasing the number of differences between the sequences. Now we need to pick a method of phylogenetic computation. One common method is called neighbor joining. Broadly speaking, this method finds the sequences that are most similar between two species and treats that pair as a single, averaged sequence. Then it finds the next most similar pair, then the next, and so on, until all the sequences form a nested hierarchy of relatedness. This method just compares similarities between sequences, but doesn't necessarily incorporate the logic of evolution into it. A method that does is called maximum parsimony. Remember from the orangutan's tale that parsimony means, all else being equal, the fewest assumptions are needed to explain a phenomenon, the better that explanation is. Thus, this method then compares all the possible trees to figure out which topology requires the fewest changes from one sequence to another, or the fewest convergences between sequences. Thus, we return to our question on character weighting. Differences that are unique to a single sequence are uninformative and not used by the parsimony method, but they are used by the neighbor joining method. The parsimony method relies on differences that are shared between sequences. Large scale changes such as insertions, deletions, or duplications are much less likely to be shared between species as a result of convergence, so they are given more weight than single point mutations. For example, an endogenous retrovirus, which is a viral-derived sequence that is passed from generation to generation, existing in the same location in two species due to chance, is extremely low. The diploid genomes of humans and chimps are about 6.4 billion base pairs long, so the same virus inserting itself in the same chromosomal location in both species at random is 1 in 6.4 billion squared, or 1 in 4.096 times 10 to the 19th power. However, while it is not completely random, viral integration is far from site-specific, such that the odds of two insertions occurring at identical loci remains a vanishingly small number. So, the most parsimonious conclusion is clearly that humans and chimps share sequences as a result of common descent. Or, applying this line of reasoning to gibbons, the fact that only gibbons have the lava retrotransposons, which are a composite of other repeats, indicates that this genetic structure arose prior to their last common ancestor. A downside of the parsimony method is long branch attraction, or LBA. This arises when two lineages have undergone many changes, especially the convergences and reversions that are common to the base of phylogenetic trees, which cause parsimony methods to link them together by having many changes rather than actual relatedness. The reason for this is that DNA is made of only four bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, thus independent changes to the same letter are likely to occur eventually. Some mutations shared between two sequences are going to be due to chance alone, and this will unfortunately attract the branches. Another method is called the maximum likelihood, which compares both branch lengths and mutation rates. A computer estimates the probability of a certain mutation occurring and assumes a random evolutionary tree with its branch lengths known. Then the computer calculates the likelihood of that particular tree. The algorithm goes through all the trees, searching for the ones with the highest or maximum likelihood. The tree with the highest likelihood is generally considered the best and is, all else being equal, more likely to be true. However, if there are other trees that are only slightly less supported than the one with the maximum likelihood, then the disagreements between them may be considered unresolved by the data. Another approach, called Bayesian phylogenetics, looks at all possible trees and gives proportionally more credence to the ones with higher likelihoods. This method not only provides probabilities for the nodes, but also allows researchers to adjust rates of evolution along the branches. Therefore, the branches are not just the amount of changes, but the amount of changes over a period of time. 
This concept is known as the molecular clock, and it is one we will return to in the Velvet Worm's tale. Next, researchers may determine the robustness to error. The more taxa that are included in a phylogeny, the more room there is for error. As a result, researchers often employ bootstrap values. To quote a 2018 paper, quote, The bootstrap test measures the internal consistency of a molecular data set by analyzing if slightly modified alignments support the same clade. More specifically, it is a resampling test so that, in each cycle, a replicate alignment is built. To generate each replicate alignment, the algorithm samples sites, i.e. alignment columns, from the original full alignment. This is done with replacement until the original number of sites is reached. Hence, for each replicate, some sites from the original alignment will be removed, whereas others will be sampled more than once. A replicate tree will be generated for each replicate alignment. This is usually repeated for 100 times, generating 100 replicate trees. The bootstrap value for a clade is the proportion of the replicate trees that recovered that particular clade. These values may be mapped on a bootstrap consensus tree, which is built by summarizing all replicate trees using a consensus method." Close quote. What does all of this have to do with gibbons? The rooted tree for gibbons based on morphology has low bootstrap values, but the rooted tree utilizing mitochondrial DNA has somewhat higher values, though for some nodes the bootstrap values are still disappointingly low. This may be due to a couple of reasons. First, gibbons appear to have diverged near simultaneously about 5 million years ago, which means hybridization between lineages has likely occurred repeatedly throughout their short geological history. Or, as we discussed in the Bonobo's Tale, incomplete lineage sorting could account for this discrepancy. As a 2014 paper points out, 15.4% of the gibbons' genomes support a phylogeny in which Hylobates is sister to all the rest, and 13.2% of the genomes support a phylogeny in which Nomascus is sister to all the rest. Given all the available molecular data, the researchers conclude the best phylogeny is one in which Hylobates branches first, then Nomascus, and finally Hulok and Symphalangus are sister to each other. Interestingly, the paper also calculated the effective population size for gibbons and found that it never dropped below a few thousand individuals. So that's the gibbons tale. A lot of math and computer processing goes into figuring out which phylogenetic tree best represents the relationship between a set of species and how confident we can be in that tree. By doing this, researchers can then make predictions about what they should look for in the future. For example, if two clades are found to be closely related to each other, then we should expect to find organisms in the fossil record that possess characteristics that are shared between those clades, as well as characters primitive to both. For example, armed with the knowledge that tetrapods evolved from lobe-finned fish at a particular time in geologic history, Neil Shubin and colleagues found Tiktaalik. Similar stories have occurred for Diarthrognathus, Svika Mirma, Microraptor, and numerous other fossils. Making a phylogeny isn't just about reconstructing the past, it's about making potentially falsifiable hypotheses that can be tested with future data. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.